Thank you, Laura and Andrew. Beautiful. Good morning. I'm Susan Wolf, and uh, it's my joy, joy to welcome you to Unity Church of Ames this morning. And in honor of Earth Day, which was Wednesday, we're going to uh, dedicate our service this morning to the Earth Day theme. So we'll enjoy that. Um, so welcome to all, and uh, today's chaplain is Charlene Ball, and she'll be available to pray with you from 11.30 to 11.50 in the prayer room. And please join us for coffee and treats after this service. <laughs> one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotent. And now the Unity Church of Ames affirmation. Through the divine spirit within us, we create a better church and a better world. So be it. for ordering the sunshine when I left Kansas City this morning. It was all gloomy and so you guys have a lock on the good weather today. So uh, I uh, am very, very honored and pleased to be back. Uh, and I understand the last time that I was scheduled to be back that uh, you guys were expecting Christ Foster. <laughs> We get confused all the time. 
I show up at his events, he shows up at mine, I'm not sure. We gotta talk for ages, we gotta get this straight. Um, but uh, thank, thank you, Heather, for uh, coming through at the very last minute when the snow was uh, too great for me to travel, and I was so indebted to to uh, Deb for having another opportunity for me to come up and share. Just just a brief update uh, with the family. My daughter is uh, nine months into her Rotary Exchange in Austria, and uh, she will be home July 17th. Uh, she'll be over there about three weeks short of a year. My son, Zachary, is uh, almost as tall as me now, and uh, he just won an award at the Kansas City Jazz Festival for most outstanding soloist of the day. Uh, he's pursuing music um, uh, against uh, his father's wishes. No, that's not true, I'm just I'm being a joker. Uh, but he is uh, doing really well, and uh, he's got one more year of school, and he's going to attend UMKC uh, there in Kansas City. And uh, Sean and I are just this past Friday celebrated our 22nd anniversary. So. And she seems to regards as long as, uh, as well, about two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go to lunch with Joe Self. And she says, make sure you say hello to everybody. So Joe, we're saying hello from you to everybody here at Unity of Ames. And uh, she might be looking at a position at the Daily Word as their assistant editor. So that's... That's possibly in the works, so hold her in prayer for that position. She's, uh, she's really excited at that possibility. Uh, I can't say that she's going to be that, but we'll see. But uh, anyway, I, uh, moving on, a conviction of the heart. Uh, this uh, song came into my life last summer. As I mentioned before, my... Um, my son is quite the musician, and, and I say this with, uh, with great reserve. Uh, it's always, you know, you're always, as a parent, you're wanting to tell everybody how great your kids are, you know. Uh, my son has an exceptional musical talent, and being a professional musician myself, I can honestly and, and con with conviction say, yes, he, he is a very talented young man. Um, and uh, he was invited last summer to go to a music camp. It was called the Grammy Revolution Camp. And uh, he had to audition, and they only selected 25 children from all of the Kansas City area. And he was one of them. And uh, it was a three-week camp that was put on by the Grammy Foundation out of California, and they flew their staff out to the Kansas City Sprint Center, and that they worked with these kids in the areas of songwriting and performance. And it was a, a really intense eight hour a day camp for, for three solid weeks. And it culminated at a performance at the Kauffman Center with all of these kids performing songs that they had written over the last three weeks. It was an extraordinary event. Uh, very, very proud of him. Well, one of the things that came with the camp was the kids got some perks. Since this was at the Sprint Center, they got backstage passes for shows, they got the opportunity to speak to some of the stars that were coming to the Sprint Center to perform, and they had the opportunity to go to some of the concerts. Uh, I still hate my son that he got a chance to go see Paul McCartney for free. <laughs> you know, little jerk. And, uh, <laughs> But one of the things that they did, there was a show coming to the uh, Sprint Center that was called Night of the Proms. And they allowed us as the parents and the families of these, uh, I guess they felt sorry that we were having to drive them down to Kansas City every day from all over uh, the Kansas City area. Uh, they allowed us to go to this show called Night of the Proms. And this was a show that was, uh, it started out with classical music and it, and it, uh, it had different artists from the mid 80s, mid 70s that I, of course I grew up with. Uh, uh, most notably, they had the Pointer Sisters, and uh, they were accompanied by a guy named Nile Rogers, who was one of the most prolific songwriters and producers. And uh, uh, everyone in here has heard Nile Rogers' music. You may not know who he is directly, but you have heard his music. A uh, uh, very influential person in the music world. And he actually did a sit down with the kids. It was wonderful. We got to attend that as well. Uh, also in the show 
was Michael McDonald of Doobie Brothers fame and the song What a Fool Believes. Uh, he was the guy who wrote that for the Doobie Brothers. And um, Kenny Loggins was part of the show. And this isn't Jesus. This is Kenny Loggins on the screen here, in case you were wondering. It does look like Jesus, though. I mean, you know, it could be construed as Jesus, but this is Kenny Loggins. Um, and, you know, I've heard Kenny Loggins all my life. Danny's song, and uh, your mama don't dance, and your daddy don't rock and roll. Um, uh, what a, uh, Footloose was, of course, one of his big hits as well. We've all heard Kenny Loggins music. So he comes out in front of 9,000 or so people, and he starts playing this song. And I'm like, wow, I've never heard this song. And I keep listening and trying to figure out the title of the song. I'm like, what, what is this? And, and he was just so into this song, and he was just playing. You could tell he was pouring his heart into this song. And not only was he pouring his heart into the song, but I happened to notice about 50 to 75 feet over to my right, there was a guy that was standing up while he was singing this song, pumping his fist, and just singing every word along with Kenny Loggins. And I'm like, man, how did I miss this song? I mean, obviously this has not you know, just been let out, this, uh, unless this guy you know, spent in the studio with him or something. And so there was an intermission in the show, and I decided that well, I was going to go over there and I was going to find that guy who was doing the fist pumping, and I'm going to ask him, okay, you got to tell me, what is the name of that song? And he says, I think it's a song called Conviction of the Heart. Well, I was so moved by the song, and you know, by the time I got home that night, the first thing I did was I went to my computer and I fired up YouTube and I looked up this song by Kenny Loggins and sure enough, uh, there it was. Uh, it was Conviction of the Heart. And I listened to it uh, numerous times. I, I, I immediately fell in love with it and the song catapulted past all of Kenny Rogers, other, or, or sorry, Kenny Loggins' songs in my head. Uh, and. Uh, you know, immediately became the, my favorite song of his. And if I do say Kenny Rogers, I do mean Kenny Loggins. So <laughs> it's just, I gotta rewire my brain here. Kenny Loggins of Loggins and Messina. Uh, so I just, uh, I fell in love with the song and I really enjoyed uh, the message of the song. I found that also this ha happens to be one of the Earth Day am anthems that, uh, um, the, the words that really jumped out at me that really spoke to my heart were, where are the dreams that we once had? Just think in your life here for a minute. We've all had dreams that we aspire to. Where are they? This is the time to bring them back. What are the promises that are caught on the tips of our tongues? What are we not promising ourselves? Do we forget or forgive? There's a whole other life waiting to be lived when one day we're brave enough to live with conviction of the heart. Some beautiful words there. And it reminds me of living with conviction. And what does that mean? And how does that fill our life up? Are we living with conviction? And if we're not, what are the consequences of not living with conviction? Do you believe what you want to believe? Or are you living a life of truth? So this story came to mind. You may have heard this table. And then the story goes that there was a frog and a scorpion sitting on one side of the riverbank. And they, they both desire to get to the other side. Well, of course, for a frog, there's no problem. The frog can just, it's amphibian, it just hops in the water and scoots across. Well, the scorpion, desiring to get up to the other side, he looks at the frog and he says, would you give me a ride on your back? And the frog says, I'll no sooner get to the other side and you'll sting me, and then you'll devour me. And the frog says, no. No, 
or no, the scorpion says, no, no, if you get me to the other side, I'll forever be your friend. Just help me get to the other side. The frog was very tentative, and he said, I'm not sure, and, and the scorpion just persisted, and he finally said, okay, I'll give you a ride to the other side. So the scorpion hops, hops on the back, back of the frog, they scoot across to the other side, and no sooner do they hit the shore, the scorpion stings the frog, and then injects a lethal dose of venom into the frog. And as the frog lay there dying, he's saying, but you promised. You said you wouldn't do this. And the scorpion said, you knew I was a scorpion. The frog knew what the truth was. But he didn't have the conviction to believe it fully. And he let himself become victim to a circumstance that cost him dearly. This is a pretty intense little fable. But this doesn't just show up in fables. You may remember this story. This happened on January 13, 1982. Air Florida Flight 90 was sitting on the tarmac of Washington National Airport, which is now called the Ronald Reagan International Airport. And there was a snowstorm that was going up and down the East Coast that was battering the coast, so much so that even Airports such as LaGuardia were closed. They, they could not accept flights in or out. And they had de-iced the plane. And as they de-iced the plane, the, the plane made its way out onto the runway. But unfortunately, because of the delays of getting the planes off, the plane had to sit on the runway an extra 45 minutes. Well, the co-pilot, his name is Larry, he says, you know, he's, he's making these comments to the pilot saying, you know, are the icers off? And the pilot says, yes. And he says, you know, this doesn't, yeah, I'm not sure about this. And the, co and the pilot was not picking, picking up on his subtleties. He was listening to him, but he wasn't paying attention to him. He wasn't getting the message that this co-pilot was trying to infer by his suggestions. And they can hear him on the black box as the plane finally starts making its way down the runway. The co-pilot saying, something's not right. Something's really not right. And yet, he did not insist that they abort the mission. The mission. They continued with the takeoff, only to find themselves about a minute later crashing into the Potomac River. The co-pilot and the pilot and 76 other people perished that day because this co-pilot lacked that conviction to say, stop this plane right now, this is not going to work. Have we ever found ourselves in a position where we knew something wasn't going to work and we kept going anyway? I gotta get a hand or two here, I think, right? We just said, no, no, you know, I don't know. Is this gonna work? Ah, but you know, I guess everybody else is doing it, right? It's like the, the kids in school who, who follow the bad kid, you know, they're they're gonna do something bad in school and um, they keep going. And all of a sudden, they're all in trouble. It's happened. It happened in my high school. I remember that. So how are we living? Are we living with that conviction? Are we involved in something right now that we truly believe in? Or if we don't truly believe in, whatever it is we're involved in, whether it be our job, whether it be a family situation, whether it be uh, you know, involved in a community event, can we listen to our heart? Can we do it with the conviction? Or can we walk away from it with that conviction in our heart? We need to look no further than the life and the way shower Jesus and how he lived with conviction. 
Jesus was someone who had an understanding of the applications of faith in his day. And as he philosophically discussed this, and there's of course the study of him, or the story of him when he was 12 years old, and he's in the temple and he's talking with the, the priests and the scribes, and, and they were astounded at his wisdom. He had a deeper understanding of just the letter of the law. Jesus had an understanding and an application of the spirit of the law. And he exemplified this throughout his life, where he was healing people on the Sabbath. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who followed the letter of the law perfectly, but they could not understand how a man could take it. And heal somebody on the Sabbath. This was against Jewish, this was against custom. I won't say it's against Jewish law. I actually confirmed this with a rabbi. He said, no, you know, life is always an ultimate responsibility, uh, even on the Sabbath. And there's no real indication that Jesus, you know, was breaking the law. But what he was doing, he was breaking the mold of the understanding that had developed, at least amongst those who were following him, whether it be the Pharisees or the Sadducees. And he wanted to emphasize, this is more important. Healing and loving is more important than any words written in our Torah. This was something that he brought back the feeling and the spirit of the law into Judaism. He lived with that conviction. And as he healed the man with a hand that was a withered hand, the Bible says in Mark 3, verse 5, that they sought ways to put him to death. So here was Jesus living with a conviction of knowing what he knew was morally right, at the risk of being put to death. Jesus, of course, is not the only person um, that that is affected. You know, we, we look, especially this month, the early part of the month, April 4th, was the anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King, who was someone who lived his truth beyond the laws of the land. He lived with a conviction knowing that there was a greater truth, a greater justice, a greater way of being. The same way with Mahatma Gandhi, who he drew so much inspiration from. The conviction of Jesus, the conviction of those other world leaders to inspire us. And we, so we again ask ourselves, what is my conviction? Am I standing for something? What is that saying? If you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything? What are you standing for? What are you believing about yourself? What are you believing about your life and how you're showing up here today? Of course, we can also look for inspiration at our co-founders, Charles and Myrtle. Charles and Myrtle had plenty of convictions. The famous saying that we see so much uh, that we we they happened to find it uh, found it in Charles's writings. Uh, it was written in 1893, where they both signed their creed, or, the, or where they committed all of their belongings and everything to spirit. And they wrote that per, as a personal statement, as a as a vision statement, as a mission statement for themselves. And it was only after its discovery 50 years later that it became sort of popularized. But we can look at what they were truly had that conviction for in their life and the conviction in unity and to believe that there was a deeper understanding there was a deeper meaning to the scriptures there was something more that people weren't getting Myrtle had the conviction that if she gave thanks to her body for its perfect function that that would manifest even more and she was able to outlive a six month death conviction she outlived her conviction by 40 years by believing something else 
by choosing to focus her energies on that which was positive and that which was whole and true and the essence of her being. She knew the truth inside of her was greater than the truth outside of her. That trumps all. And it works in reverse. If everyone outside is telling you how great you are and you really see yourself as low and, and, and you don't have that good self-esteem, has anyone ever looked in the mirror and, and criticized himself? <laughs> really? That's, that's where our beliefs are. We have to shift that and turn that around. We have to start loving ourselves. We're not this shell that we are. We're deeper than that. We are a spiritual being. And we are perfect and whole in every way. Every single person in here is perfect and whole in every way. Our bodies may manifest something, but we are not our bodies. We are perfect and whole beings on the divine path. I love one of the stories that I've heard. I've heard several stories about the film wars, but a couple come to mind. Uh, one was... Uh, Myrtle was at a gathering of church people, and they were talking about finances. And one of the congregants said, boy, I sure hope the money holds out. Has that ever been a discussion in this church? <laughs> and Myrtle said, money is not our problem. Let's pray that our faith holds out. Let's pray that our faith holds out. <clears throat> Faith is the manifestation of money, the essence of believing and receiving. Charles uh, was also, uh, at one time in his in early unity, there was a man that came to, to reclaim the printing press that they were using. And Charles pleaded with the man and he said, you know, I don't have the money now, but I have a rich father. And we'll make that payment in a timely manner. Now he wasn't referring to his earthly father. He was referring to the God, the source of all good. We can say these words, but do we have conviction in these words? Are we really, truly believing them? Or are we just giving them lip service? Unity gives us this opportunity every Sunday or every day, every hour, to revisit and to know our truth, to eradicate the negative thoughts and the negative thinking that we inf infiltrate, that infiltrates our mind. Some people call it the monkey mind. Oh, you're no good. Oh, you're this. Oh, you're that. Oh, you're, you know. What you are is your divine creation, a child of God, built with purpose, built with promise. Expressing in this universe perfectly and completely. The question is, where are your convictions? Where do they lie? Do they lie on your wholeness, your prosperity? Or do they lie on the negative side of your personality? Let's take those thoughts into meditation.
divine creation. We are made of the essence of God. We are unlimited in our thoughts, our thinking, only to the level that we believe. In this moment of meditation, let us affirm to ourselves, I am whole and complete. understanding for the wisdom that is growing in our hearts and minds to know our true beingness, our truth, to know the power of our thoughts and the manifestations that we can bring forth in our life to live Time to, to uh, take our gifts in hand and bless um, the offering. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Lord, please bless our efforts to use this gift in a way that honors you here at Unity Church of Ames as we do our work. And to, together we say, thank you, God.
us, and the presence of God washes over us wherever.